Now, for someone who is part Christmas elf, I figured out years ago that a Christmas carol is not actually about Christmas. Follow me. It's actually a Thanksgiving story. But now, Thanksgiving hadn't been invented yet when Charles Dickens was writing this, you see. But, but what Scrooge learned was not some magic of Christmas. What he learned was gratitude. He learned to be grateful for what he had in life. He learned to be grateful for what he, the blessings he had received. And then because of that, he learned then to open his hands and his heart to other people. And he learned to live with a grateful heart. It's a Thanksgiving story. And if Charles Dickens were alive today, I would say, hey, Chuck, you need to rethink that title. Maybe you need to call it a Thanksgiving carol. Hmm. may not have the same ring to it, but it might be a little more accurate. You're never going to see a movie or a TV show the same again that's based on that one. Because I'm telling you, it's a Thanksgiving story. It's a Thanksgiving story because an open heart will lead to open hands. That's the story of Scrooge. It's not, it's not what he started off being, it's what he ended up being. It's what he became as a result of, of this, this epiphany that he had to be grateful and to live life with a grateful heart. Well, the problem, though, for us is kind of like the same as Scrooge. We sometimes don't see that connection. We don't see the connection between gratitude and generosity. We don't often see the connection between an open heart and then open hands, or even living in a way that welcomes others into our hearts. And because we fail to see that connection between those two, we can sometimes try to do it in reverse. We can sometimes try to make generosity happen, but we do it in a begrudging manner. Like, here's a, here's a shocker. Did you know that uh, food pantries and soup kitchens and things like that, did you know they actually need help all 12 months out of the year and not just in November and December when most people go and serve? Why do we do it in November and December? That's what you're supposed to do in Thanksgiving and Christmas. You're supposed to be generous. But then come January, we're all hitting the gym again, and, and we forget all about all that helping business. Why do we do that? Because we're, we're, we're producing it the other way around. We're producing, we're trying to produce generosity for the sake of generosity and not realizing that it's an open-handedness because of an open-heartness. So we can miss that very powerful connection that really can reframe the entire idea of things living. Because what we've been saying this entire series is as disciples of Jesus, Thanksgiving is not just the fourth Thursday of November. It's something that was invented a long time ago in the mind of God that we're to live as grateful people. So my hope that I've said every single week, unashamedly have said every single week, is that I hope that the month of gratitude of November doesn't discourage us from doing those good things in November and December, but it helps us carry it on from January through next October, that we truly understand the power of gratitude, that we understand what it can do in our lives and what it can do for others, but it starts with our lives. It starts with us. As the old expression goes, I have seen the enemy and we are they. It starts with me. We have to start this process. And this four-part series concludes today, part number four. I'm always a little sad when a series comes to an end, uh, especially the short ones. When they're just four weeks long, I feel like I just settled down on them and then we're done. But today we're talking about the sign of gratitude. We're talking about how gratitude now is seen by others and how it, it flows out of our lives. And just because next Sunday starts Advent and the Christmas season does not mean we pack Thanksgiving away. It doesn't mean we stop being grateful. Again, the goal has been to take the power of gratitude with us through the rest of the year and to live differently, just like Ebenezer Scrooge did. The way the story ends is not where it begins. He ended differently than where he started. And may that be said of us as well because we interacted with this power of gratitude. We're in the Old Testament book of Exodus today. Exodus chapter 35, uh, verses 4 through 9, and then chapter 36, 1 through 7. Now you might be asking yourself, self, why did he skip all those verses? Glad you asked. Here's the answer. If I actually went through the entire story in 35 and 36, it would take more time than I have. So I'm having to give you the bookends, and I hope I whet your appetite a little bit to, to see the book, what's happening in between the bookends and what happens just before it and what happens just after it. it. It is an incredible passage right there towards the end of Exodus when you see what God is doing with his people. But we're going to see some bookends to see how uh, the sign of gratitude plays out in their lives. So follow along, either print or electronic on the screen. I don't care how you get in the Bible, just get into it so it can get into you. Uh, Exodus 35, verses 4 through 9. 
9 says, Moses said to the whole assembly, uh, excuse me, to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. Now down to chapter 36, verses 1 through 7. So Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued bringing free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Now verse 5 of chapter 35 in the book of Exodus there is showing us right here at the front that generosity is tied to gratitude. There's an inescapable connection between these two ideas. Moses tells the people, all that are willing to give, give this offering. Now, we're reading this in English. When Moses is saying this in the Old Testament, he's saying it in Hebrew. The book of Exodus is originally in Hebrew, so we're reading a translation. Sometimes you lose something in translation. We hear willing, and, and we understand what that word means well enough. But in our English version, in the New International Version that uh, I'm using and I teach from and most of our teaching guys teach from and most of you are using, if you're on an electronic Bible, you have thousands of Bible versions available to you. Um, we have no loss of knowledge, but it's all over the place. But if you're reading in the New, New International Version, you see the word willing. If you are willing, give this if you're willing. But it's actually translating two Hebrew words. And they're translating into one English word. The first word means uncoerced or voluntary, uh, or in, it implies generosity, but it's a generosity based on uh, something that is free will, that you are choosing to do something. The second word is usually translated heart or mind or spirit or, you know, that, that reference to your innermost being. So the idea is it is an uncoerced, uh, voluntary, generous heart to give something. That's, that's not easy to translate in a couple of words because it's kind of a phrase. But the New Living Translation of the Bible gets awfully close to conveying the idea. Now, on the second part of verse 5 of Exodus 35, the New Living Translation says it this way, that those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. See, the idea is not that they're being forced to do it. The idea is that they have a generosity in their heart and it's overflowing in their hands. See, it's a different tone than just saying, well, you've got it to give. I'm going to strong arm you into doing it. I'm not saying you already have the generous heart and now Moses is giving them an opportunity to give. It's a very different tone than, than some kind of being forced to do it. So verse 5 is reminding us that generosity is tied to gratitude. Now, we go on in, in verse thir chapter 36, verses 1 through 3, and we see that generosity is more than finances. This, this is interesting to me. I love this part. Uh, look at it again, verse 1. It says this. These are where all the names come in. So Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. And sometimes I get asked, how do you pronounce all these names? I tell them, number one, I practice. Two, uh, here's the trick with Old Testament names. The accent is usually on the second to last syllable. 
It's also called the penultimate, but that's a different term. Okay, but if you remember penultimate, you're going to win like some game because that's a big word. It means second to last. So on Hebrew names, second to last is usually how you pronounce it. That's totally a freebie. Wasn't even in my notes, but sometimes people ask that. And it's not that I'm smart, I just learned the trick. Okay, second to last syllable, and that's how you pronounce the names. Here's the other thing I learned uh, these people now are all dead, and they do not care. Sorry. I mean, someone calls me Joel. I don't get offended, but I'm usually called Joel. I'm alive, and so I care. They don't. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, generosity is more than finances. The reason I point this out is not the pronunciation. That's totally an aside, totally a freebie. Uh, You didn't pay a dime for that one. Uh, But the reason I point that out is because these skilled craftsmen, the best of their nation, they, we don't know for sure if they gave any particular valuable item. But they gave what they had. What they had was incredible skill. They had the work of their hands. And so their offering, their generosity, wasn't them writing a check, so to speak. It was their giving of themselves. It was their offering of their trade, their livelihood, their literally their bodies is what they donated. Now, in the time of ancient Israel that we're in when we're looking at the book of Exodus, they weren't using money or coins for goods and services. That's how we do it. We pay money, we get a good, we get a service. Egypt was doing it a little bit, but that's not something Israel took out with them. They took the gold coins because they wanted the gold, but that's a different issue. So they, they would trade. So it would be like if I was an ancient Israelite man and I had a tear in my tent I might offer you two bunches of grapes or maybe some wool for you to come and repair my tent. We would trade. That's, that was their economy. By the time you get into King David, that was different. Now they had coins, but you're, you're talking a different era of history. This point, though, they were, they were making trades. So for them, they were giving of their livelihood. That was still an offering. They gave of that. It's more than, than just finances. But what I find so interesting is the fact that for us today, it's not just writing a check. It's writing our hearts. Because that's what they did. They gave what they had. They would actually stop doing other work and doing their livelihood to work on this sanctuary, also called the tabernacle. This was their portable worship center as they went through the wilderness in Egypt. So while they're doing this, we're reminded that generosity is more than writing a check. It's investing of our hearts. Then we get to verses 4 through 7, which is an amazing part in the story. It's the reminder that generosity ensures there's always enough. Generosity ensures that there's never need, that that the need and the um, resources always match. And this is a rare moment in the Bible that this happens. It's so rare you can probably count on one hand the number of times it occurs this way. Uh, But in verses 4 through 7, we find this in Exodus 36. It says, so all the skilled workers who were doing all the work, so skilled workers, those are the the craftsmen, the experts that were giving up their bodies to do this, okay? They were doing all the work on the sanctuary, left what they were doing, notice what they did, and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from giving more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. I mean, when was the last time you heard someone in my world come up and go, y'all have given too much, stop giving? I've never heard that. Moses said that. You've given too much already, stop, stop. Now, there's also an element of practicality. This was their portable worship center. So obviously anything they didn't use was going to be wasted. So there was a stewardship issue there too. But it's the fact that people were so grateful and they had so much gratitude in their heart for what the Lord had done. We're going to come back to why in a minute. That they just overflowed and overflowed and overflowed and overflowed to the point that Moses said, enough. There's more than plenty to do what the Lord has called us to do. Now there's an important lesson there too. It's all by itself. That's an important lesson. Because it means that, that when God calls us to an enterprise, when he calls us to do something for him, it means not only is he going to fund it, it means he's also going to provide that which is necessary to facilitate it. He's not just going to say, here's some money. Have at it, kids. No, he's going to say, here are the resources, but here's also the people that's going to make it happen. See, he provided their money, the, the gold, the bronze, we think of it as money, but he provided the goods, but he also provided the skilled craftsmen who knew what to do with those things. 
To put it in our terms, I mean, that means we all are part of the funding and we're all part of the facilitating of what God has done. Yeah, of course we give. That's the most obvious. But it also means we give time and we serve. It means that, that we invite friends and family and coworkers and neighbors and total strangers. We're invested in that. It means we do things like Operation Christmas Child or we serve as a collection center for Operation Christmas Child or kicking off today our angel tree ministry. It's, it's a table outside. You've got to go see that. This is an amazing thing we do. Go ask them all about it. They'll be happy to tell you. Okay, but, but why do we do this angel tree? Why do we give like the generosity? Because we love people. God not only provides the funds, he provides the means to facilitate it. That's what's amazing. See, I get to see that all the time in my role because I get to see how the church functions. And that not only has he provided resources, he's provided people. He's provided people who lead and people who's able to get stuff done and people who are creative and people who can think of new ways of doing things. And see, God provides all of that to fund and to facilitate his enterprise, just like he did for them. So Exodus 35 and 36, and the little snippets that I took from us, these bookends on this story, that shows us how God is commanding something and then how it was fulfilled absolutely perfectly as he designed it, reminds us of the key power of generosity. And it's this, that gratitude overflows as generosity. Gratitude overflows as generosity, that an open heart will lead to open hands that, that what we are given when we're grateful, we don't, we don't clench it. We just receive it so that we can pass it on. And that doesn't always mean money. It's more than finances. It means sometimes we're passing on our heart or a skill or a trade. It means that we're investing in the people, investing in the work of God. And Israel had a lot of reasons to be grateful to God. I told you we're coming back to it. See, the reason this happened, the reason that they were able to do all this was because of their own story and what God had done in their, in their lives. See, when they were slaves in Egypt, they prayed for deliverance. God delivered them. He brought them out of Egypt. He brought them from slavery, made them into a nation. He led them across the Red Sea on dry land and then used the same Red Sea to wreck Pharaoh's army. Then he took them and he gave his people quail and manna to sustain them physically. He fed them while they're in the wilderness. He gives them water from a rock. They just witness miracle after miracle after miracle. Then he gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them the law. He tells them, this is how you live as my people so that you will find the path of blessing in me. What a gift. And he gives that to them. And then he says, best of all, he says, when you leave this place, I will go with you. My presence will accompany you. That was the reason for the portable worship center the sanctuary or the tabernacle. That, that's why they had it. That was, that was the symbol. That's how God's presence moved with them. They had so much reason to be grateful. And they had all this wealth, not because they got rich as slaves, but a little bitty detail on their way in deliverance, that on their way out of Egypt, Scripture tells us they plundered Egypt without raising a sword because the Egyptians just gave it to them. They gave them all the stuff that they would eventually need in the wilderness, all the things they would eventually need to build this sanctuary, this tabernacle, that God had already provided for it. And so they had reason to be grateful, and so it overflowed as generosity. God gave it to them. So they weren't going to be stingy with it. They gave it back. And yet there was still so much left over that they get told to stop giving. God had blessed them enormously. And they had reason for their generosity to overflow, or their, excuse me, their gratitude to overflow as generosity. Back in mid-2019, seems like so long ago, <laughs> but it was just about a year ago, uh, a lady named Eileen Taylor, she's probably on Facebook, but she's just a regular person like you or me. She's not famous. I don't even know what she does, to tell you the truth. She does something. I'm sure she works. Her name was Eileen Taylor. She was a little short on money, but she had one thing that she would do. The one treat she allowed herself is every morning on her way to work, she would go through the drive through of a Heavenly Donuts, and she would get one donut and one black coffee. Coffee that cost her like two bucks. Well, she was in line this particular day, and she was thinking back to yesterday when the person in front of her had paid for her donut and cup of coffee. It was just two bucks or so. But to Eileen, it meant the world. See, Eileen was a little short on money in that season, and things were very tight. Again, that was the one treat she allowed herself. 
But she was so moved by that act of generosity and, and the day before that in gratitude, she tells the person at the drive through hey, I want to pay for the person behind me today. Okay, well, the person behind her was getting a little bit more than a donut and a coffee. They had an order that totaled $12. It was already tight for Eileen, but she said, I'm so grateful for what someone did for me. I'll go ahead and pay it. This ignited this chain of generosity that went on for 55 customers where they kept paying for the person behind them. And it lasted for two and a half hours. Generosity is contagious when it's motivated by gratitude. And this lady, who's just a normal person like us, impacted at least 55 or 54 other people, not to mention the, the employees who sat there and watched this over and over, knowing how the story started with one person who was a little tight on money but gave extravagantly. Not because she had it, but because she was so grateful. Gratitude overflows as generosity. And we find this same idea echoed in the New Testament. Actually, it's not even echoed. It's stated very clearly in the New Testament, this connection between gratitude and generosity. Paul the Apostle is trying to deal with our hearts. It always comes back to our hearts. Gratitude all by itself is going to fizzle out come December 1st. Or maybe January 1st, the first time you got to pay the bill from Christmas, generosity kind of disappears. Gratitude, though, will keep, will keep going and keep unfolding. Here's what Paul the Apostle writes in 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, verses 6 through 11. It says, remember this. Don't forget. It says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give, here's the kicker, what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the righteousness of the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Because gratitude overflows as generosity. Thus, let us show the sign of gratitude. And the sign of gratitude is generosity. Now, normally at this point in a sermon, I give you a personal example. But in this case, it seems a little self-serving. So I'm not going to do that. I will say this. Generosity is something very early on in Patty's and my marriage we wanted to be. We wanted to be those people, Lord willing, that if there was a need in someone's life, that we, we'd be able to fill it. And there have been occasions that, that, that the Lord has moved us and we've heard of a need and we've been able to give to it. And it's been incredible. But what we also learned was it didn't start with a bank account. It starts with our hearts. Starts with our hearts being willing to live gratefully to realize that what I have is only because God gave it to me. That all we have in this hand is just because God intends it to transfer to this hand to give to the next person. But it's not just finances. It's also our hearts, our time, our ability. That, that That's meant to be invested. Even the pain we go through, listen to me, even the pain we go through is meant to be invested in someone else when they go through it. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. But that starts with working on a grateful heart. Like Scrooge, you got to start with the heart. It, you got to have a change on the inside. We've seen the enemy and we are they. It starts in here. We've got to work on a grateful heart. And through this series, we, we've given a few ideas on what you can do. We talked about the blessings prayers. That's when you wake up and you're saying, Lord, thank you for a nice warm bed. Thank you for covers. You know, you hear that thunk and you, oh, the heater's on. We Californians don't like the cold. We say, Lord, thank you for the heater. Thank you that I had the money to pay the bill. Uh, Lord, thank you for flush toilets. Thank you for toothbrushes. Thank you for toothpaste. Thank you for floss. Thank you for modern dentistry. Lord, thank you. Uh, thank, my phone may be buzzing and, and annoying me, but thank you that someone cares enough to send a text this early in the morning. Remind me to tell them I'm sleeping in. You know, whatever. But you, you're thankful. 
And it's a, we call them blessings prayers. You're just thankful for your blessings. And then we talked about uh, saying thank you to other Christians. Those who've blessed you, those who've invested in you, those who have believed in you, your champions, to say thank you to them. Show your gratitude to them. Last week we talked about having a thankful five. Those five things that you're thankful for, and if you really think through them, they're probably not going to be material things. They're probably going to be other things, relationships probably. But to have that thankful five. Now, now the issue with this whole working on a grateful heart business means much like Nike, you got to do it. Hey, you're not going to work on it by just looking at it and going, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to get around to that. No, you won't. Do it. Like Master Yoda in Star Wars said, do or do not. There is no try. All right? It's doing it. And I don't, I don't care if you do these specific things. It's just an idea. But, but it's, 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 it's doing something that works on a grateful heart that exercises our hearts and our, ourselves to help us learn to be grateful because generosity comes out of gratitude. We don't, we're not going to become grateful by just making ourselves write a check to you know, whatever that thing is we're sponsoring every month in our life. That, that's not going to produce gratitude. That's going to produce one more bill you've got to pay. That's not gratitude. That's not generosity either, by the way. That's paying a bill or something. Okay, So you've got to work on having a grateful heart. But then as a congregation, there are things we do to show our gratitude, the sign of our gratitude that we do for our area. And we do this every year. We do it at Thanksgiving. We do it at Christmas. And I've had some of y'all... Come on, even some of y'all online, you've emailed about this. Are we still going to do that thing we do? And that we call it Thanksgiving thanks. Thanksgiving thanks to police officers and firefighters. We do this every year at Thanksgiving and Christmas where we encourage you to take a little something to police officers, firefighters. Normally, we would include um, people who work at the ER. But this is 2020, which means if you're in the ER, you are in the ER. <laughs> okay, you're not just going to visit your patient. Now, if for some reason you fall off your roof and you need to go to the ER, take a little something for the ER workers and say, thank you. Thank you for being here and tending to my broken leg. They will appreciate it. Uh, we get notes every now and again from police officers and firefighters in our area uh, who, who are expressing their gratitude to this because there are people who have to work on Thanksgiving. I mean, you know, most of us, our own offices here are closed on Thanksgiving and the day after. Most government offices are closed on Thanksgiving and the day after. Uh, your favorite store does not have to be open on Thanksgiving. We may be thankful the grocery store is open so we can get that last can of green beans that we always forget every year, but it doesn't have to be open. Those folks have to be there. I mean, they, they, they keep civilization civilized. Okay, in the ER, people take care of us and we pay our dumb taxes by falling off roofs and ladders and stuff. They got to be there. So it's our way as a congregation just to say a little thanks. And here's some ideas of things you can do. Um, sugary treats are always appreciated. Everybody likes a good bit of sugar. But when you're a police officer, firefighter, or if you're in the ER and you're an ER worker, sugary stuff only goes so far. So here's an idea that I got a few years ago from, uh, it was actually from a police officer. Uh, beef jerky is good. Beef jerky is self-contained. They can grab it and go. Uh, fruit. Fruit can be washed, and it's also, if it has the flesh on it, self-contained. They can take it and go. Um, it, like energy bars. Watch the sugar on those. Okay, I'm not anti-sugar. I like sugar, but I'm just trying to say here's some alternatives. Uh, but energy bar, again, self-contained. They can grab it and go. So think grab and go and not something they have to sit there and eat. Uh, I, I have heard that popcorn balls are a particular favorite of a few of the firefighters in our congregation. Uh, so if you want to take some popcorn balls to somebody at Cal Fire, go right ahead. And again, the idea is not that you personally adopt every single police station in the county, every single sheriff's office, you know, or every single fire station or every single hospital. or No, no, it's not that. It's just saying pick something. Pick somebody and drop a little. It doesn't have to be big. A little something. Just say, just thank you. Thank you for working today because I don't have to. Thank you. I appreciate you. It goes so far. Wow, it does. Because we are grateful as a congregation. Something that you probably don't know, uh, but during the full shutdown that happened between March and the end of May, when like nobody was here, we weren't in our offices. I mean, maybe once or twice a week, a few of us would come by, we'd check the mail, we'd kind of, uh, Tony, our facilities guy, would be watching all the security cameras on his phone, you know, OCD, because nobody's here. So we're watching. But we'd notice that uh, Merced PD would park uh, where am I? They'd park back in that little drive space. 
And so one day I happened to be here and I, you know, if you ever walk up to a police cruiser, make sure your hands are seen all the time. But I walked up and I, I got his attention and he kind of looked at me kind of funny like, uh-oh, what's this guy going to do? And I just said, hey, I'm, I'm on staff here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for watching over the place when we're not here. And he's just like, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. He just almost was speechless because that's what Merced PD had been doing. They'd been parking at all the church campuses across our city and making sure that nothing happened while we weren't there. So for a congregation, for us, especially this year, I think this is our chance to turn around and say thank you to them. Um, you know, the firefighters, or every time we have an alarm go off, even a false alarm, you know, they'll come by and they'll check. And it's just a way to say thank you. We have medical personnel in our congregation. It's a way to say thank you. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to say thank you uh, for the fact that they have to work and we don't because we are grateful. And, and when we're grateful, that's going to overflow as generosity. That when our hearts are open, our hands will become open too. Our lives will become open. And I want you to experience the life-changing, life-giving power of not only generosity. I want you to experience the power of gratitude. Because when you experience the power of gratitude, it's going to change everything. And then you're going to have your own Ebenezer Scrooge story where whatever you were, the Lord's going to do something amazing to make you into someone that is so grateful and that is so open-handed. And you're going to find, even in that open-handedness, you're going to find that the Lord will use you and change you in amazing ways and make you appreciative of all the blessings that He has done in your life. That's been our goal in this series, and that's what I hope that you'll take into Thursday at Thanksgiving and that you'll take into the Christmas season. And when January 2021 greets us, hallelujah, we'll, we'll take it there too, and we'll try to live this way.